Today, I'm going to preach my last sermon for the Winsboro Church of Christ. Now, the thing is, I plan on preaching it lots of times. I hope to preach this lesson to you throughout the course of my career here. Uh, it was actually my intended first lesson for preaching here, but this whole coronavirus kind of threw things in a little bit of a tailspin, so my plans didn't quite work out. And I know many of your plans have not worked out over the course of the past couple of months as well. But I didn't want to go any longer. So I thought, well, this Sunday I'm going to go ahead and present my last sermon. Because, again, I intend on, whether it be maybe every year or just every once in a while, I'll pull it out and present to you the sermon that if I have anything to do with it, if I know what my last sermon is going to be, maybe I'll retire a few decades from now several decades from now, however long it is, and the, my retirement sermon will be this sermon. If I'm, for anything else, you know, life happens, situations change, and sometimes it can, and you know that too, and moves have to be made. One. You know, if at any point I know when my last sermon for this church is going to be, I want to preach this sermon. It was my last sermon I preached for the church I served up in Iowa, it was my last sermon I preached for the church I served up until recently in Oklahoma. And one day I hope it's the last sermon I can share with you. If I know it's coming. If God takes me unexpectedly or something happens and I don't know when my last sermon will be, obviously, oh well, well, part of that's the reason I want to preach it today. I want you to hear it many times. I want to kind of ingrain it into who we are. Because I need to ingrain it into who I am. Because when it comes around to it, there's one thing more important than anything else. In Christianity, in following God, and following Scripture, following the Bible, there's one thing that's more important than anything else. And that's what I would want to leave as my legacy. I don't want to leave something that's somewhat important. I want to focus on what's most important. And when it comes to Scripture, when it comes to our God, when it comes to our Lord Jesus Christ whom we serve, there is one thing that's more important than anything else. And I don't have to guess what it is. You don't have to guess what it is. All we have to do is look to the words Jesus himself spoke. Matthew chapter 22, starting in verse 34. Now when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they assembled together, and one of them, an expert in religious law, asked him a question to test him. See, Jesus was a rabbi. And what rabbis did, and maybe what even something like university professors or writers, authors, public personalities might do, politicians, is debate. Debate one idea over another idea. Come together and discuss it. And so to test him, to see what kind of a rabbi he was, they threw out a question. Now the Pharisees heard how he'd responded to the Sadducees in the previous passage about marriage and the resurrection. And the Pharisees didn't agree with the Sadducees. So they heard Jesus' response and went, ooh, that's good. Way to go. I mean, they, they were probably nodding their heads in agreement. Oh yeah, that's a good one. That's a good way to respond to the Sadducees who believed there was no resurrection. Jesus very much showed all the way back with Abraham, that in fact there was. That's in the previous passage. But where we're starting in verse 34, now the Pharisees said, well, 
Let's see if he's really up to par. Let's test him too. And they ask him a question that had been asked before to other rabbis, to other teachers. And the question was, which commandment in the law is the greatest? Which one's number one? Now, there were different ideas among the rabbis in Jesus' day, before, during, and after. Uh, different theories about the greatest commands. And whenever Jesus tells them his answer, it would not have been a shocker. Look at what Jesus says. He said to him, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. He quotes from Deuteronomy chapter 6, a very famous passage called the Shema, something that Jews for a long time, for thousands of years, have been reciting. We're reciting in the time of Jesus. I mean, this is one of those scriptures, kind of like what John 3.16 is to a Christian. I mean, if you, know, if you know any verse at all, a Jew would know this verse. And so they knew it was important. They knew it was a centerpiece of their faith. And so for Jesus to say, well, the most important one is the one he already knows most important, no big shocker there. They were maybe hoping for a different response to maybe tease their imaginations. And there were some other things going around that did just that, like the command, thou shalt not covet. Some thought, well, that's really the most important one because if you don't covet it in your heart, you'll never express it in sin. Uh, the sin will never manifest. You'll never get to that point if you stop it cold in its tracks. Good point. Or maybe thou shalt not steal, with the idea being that Anything we take that we don't deserve, we steal. And as a matter of fact, when it comes to worshiping God, when it comes to honoring God and praising Him and giving Him all glory and all honor, if we don't do that, we are robbing God. We are holding back from God what is His. And if everything's God, then give Him everything. And if God can be the one to decide what we should do and the commands we should follow, then... We would be stealing not to give our lives in service to those commands. And so they kind of, some thought that, well, that's a good one to wrap it all up into. But Jesus goes pretty traditional here. He goes with not a shocker. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. Quoting Deuteronomy chapter 6. Now this is something they recited again and again and again. This is something they knew. Yeah. Love the Lord your God. The whole passage is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and might. And that was just a part of what it meant to be a Jew. And so for Jesus to say that, yeah, good answer, Jesus. But then he throws in a twofer. He throws in something extra. Verse 38. He goes maybe where maybe they did not expect him to go. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like it. So they said, which one is number one? Jesus said, well, I'll tell you number one, and it's no shocker. It's to love God. But did you know what number two was? And number two is like it. He's not just saying, well, here's number one, it's up here, and here's number two down here. And so number one's really most important. Number two, well, it's down here and don't have to focus on it as much. He actually says they go together. Number one, love God. The thing that you've recited and ingrained into yourself and read in Scripture again and again and sang songs and chanted in the synagogues every single Sabbath day of your life. You know that command. Oh, yeah, we know that command. And it's... First importance, yeah, that's, that's, I mean, that, that's what a normal, that's what many rabbis would have said in Jesus' day. But then he says, there's a second one. Maybe you haven't thought about as much. And it's not just number two, it's like it. They go together. If you want to do number one, you've got to learn to do number two. They're two sides of the same coin, really. That second command is to love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, all the law and the prophets, all the other teachings of God, 
that you know the Jews had, and that Christianity springs more off of, and Jesus fulfills those commands, completes those commands. He is the fulfillment of all the law and the prophets, and so he is the embodiment of love. But it says all these other things that we focus on or that we think are important, and that are important, they are summed up. They depend on. All the law and the prophets depend on these two commandments. Interesting word in this translation, depend. Basically, if you can read a command whatever command God would give, any of them, you need to put on the glasses of love to understand it. And that might be a challenge because some of the commands are strange, especially in the Old Testament, and that we might wrestle with, and maybe they wrestled with way back then, and we might wrestle with for different reasons because we live in a very different society and culture and expectations. But basically, if you want to understand what God's trying to get at with any law, frame it under love God, love each other. And if you can't put a law of God under the umbrella of love God, love each other, if it seems foreign or disconnected, like, well, here's love God, love each other, here's this other command saying to do something different, well, if that's how you would take them, then you're not understanding it right. You need to bring it in under the whole of love God, love each other. They, they depend. Every other command depends and is really in subjection to and underneath the greatest commands. That doesn't mean they're not important. No, but it means they're not as important as loving God and loving each other. I don't care what other command it is. And here he's specifically talking about the law and the prophets, but Jesus could have said anything. Any of the commands that are yet to come in the New Testament. And whatever they might be. Commands that I think we should try our best to follow, to sing and make melody in our heart. Absolutely. That's an important command that I want to follow. But you know what? There's a command that's more important, I believe, because Jesus told me. Love God, love each other. That doesn't mean to sing and make melody in our hearts not important. Or to come together on the first day of the week and break bread. Doesn't mean that that's not important. But it means that all of those other commands we do have to be done with loving God, loving each other. Otherwise, we're missing it. And that's what 1 Corinthians 13 says, that famous chapter on love. All these things you can do. Speak with the tongues of men and angels. Prophesy. Understand amazing things. Even sacrifice yourself and give away to the poor and sacrifice to the point of death. Which is pretty impressive. I mean, that's, that's martyrdom right there. But Jesus said if it's not underneath love, if it's not done in love, it's not with love and through love, it's not what God wants. Every other command we have has to be built on love. And if we can't build it on love, then we're not doing it right. And I don't just say that for me. I say that because that's what Jesus said. Our Lord, our King, our Master, our Savior, the one on whom our Religion is built, and I hate, hate to even call Christianity religion, but we are the church of Christ. We belong to Him. We follow what He says. He said, the most important thing I want you to focus on all the time, that every other command you do is done with it and through it and underneath it. Love God, love each other. That's why it's my last sermon, and I hope to preach it many times. Not verbatim every time. I'll make different points and point out different things and use different illustrations, but I'll go to this verse or the verses in Mark and Luke that are just like it again and again and again because why? Because Jesus said it's the most important. And one day when I know it's the very last thing I'll ever get to tell you, 
from a pulpit in the sermon I'll get to preach. The last thing I'll be able to leave you with, I want to leave you with the most important thing. Love God, love each other. Because they go together. 1 John chapter 4, verse 20 says that it is impossible to love the God whom we have not seen if we hate the brother we have seen. When I might ask, well, okay, number one command, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind. Good answer, Jesus, yeah. How do we do it? What does that look like? And that's where that second command comes in. You love your neighbor as yourself. You cannot love God and hate your neighbor. It is impossible, we're told in Scripture. You can sing to them. You can pray to them. If you can do all these other little commands, and in comparison, all of them are little commands compared to love the Lord your God. Again, it's number one. But if you want to love the Lord your God, how you do it, you love your neighbors yourself. If someone were to tell me, oh, Colby, I love you, I would say, well, I love you too. I hope I would, and I hope I would mean it. We are to love one another. I try to obey that command. As a church, I hope we try collectively to obey that command. But let's say somebody says, Colby, I love you. And yet, I saw them interacting with my children later that day, or my wife, or maybe my best friend, or maybe they're all in a cluster. My close friends and my wife and my kids and my other family, my mother, my brothers, uh, those that I love dearly, those that are closest to me. And yet I see this person who said they loved me and yet they are mistreating them, bringing them down, causing them harm emotionally or physically or both. that would make me question in a big way whether or not they really love me. Now, if you love me, you don't have to like everything about me. You don't have to like everything about my family, my extended family or immediate family or my friends. I mean, there might be things you don't like. We're all human. That's okay. But I would hope that in your love for me, you would at least extend kind of a bare minimum respect, appreciation, uh, kindness toward those that I love. And if you didn't, I would say, well, you may say you love me, but you don't understand me if you don't love the people that I love. If you don't share in that, at least in a very minimal way. And of course, God doesn't want us to just do it in a minimal way. He says, love your neighbor as yourself. Who, and who is my neighbor? Jesus answered that with a parable called the Good Samaritan. We'll get to that some other time too. But if we want to love God, we love His children. You can't do one and not the other. And how God wants to see our love for Him is shown in how we love one another. And love, this greatest command, what I want to leave with you today and leave with you someday when I'm done preaching or when the Lord calls me home or whatever. So love is not just get the warm fuzzies. And I hope that your time of being in church over the years have shown that to you, that love is what we do for one another, not just what we say. Again, the person who would tell me they love me, but then mistreat my family. Uh, show me your love by showing respect and kindness and favor toward my family. 
There's a saying that's fake it till you make it. What if I don't feel like loving my neighbor? Well, good news, you don't have to. And while there's the phrase fake it till you make it, I would say, actually, when it comes to love, because love is what we do, not what we feel. Christian love, godly love. Christ didn't die for us because how he felt in that moment. He died for us because his love is eternal and unchanging. And that's the love we're supposed to love each other with. Consistent love. An unconditional love. Sometimes it's hard to know how to apply it that particular day, that particular moment. What's best for them? Because that's the question. What's best for them? I don't always know, but if I try with that motivation of what's best for them, for my neighbor, by neighbor, the person next door to me, or the person on the other side of the world, or my job, my school, whatever, where, wherever I come into contact with somebody, they are my neighbor, especially if they are in need, as the Good Samaritan points out. But if I ask the question, what's best for them, not what's best for me, or easy, or convenient, but what's best for them. And then I do it, whether I feel like it or not. When it comes to fake it till you make it, that's not faking it. By doing it anyway, I am making it. I am loving. Loving when I don't feel like it is sometimes the most powerful love we've got. There have been times when I've been frustrated with Lisa... Seven days she's been frustrated with me. <laughs> and she probably has much more valid reasons for those than I do for mine. But anybody who's married, anybody in any relationship at all, growing up with siblings or parents or kids or whatever, you know there's days that you're frustrated with each other. In the church, some days we're frustrated with each other. But sometimes in those days I've been frustrated with Lisa for the days I bought her flowers. Maybe I didn't feel like it. But I asked myself, well, do I love her? Yes. Do I want to show her I love her? Yes. And in that moment, I am loving her. It's not faking it. And some days she has done things for me. Like maybe make my favorite meal or something on a day that I may maybe made her cry. By something I've said or something I didn't say or disappointed her, frustrated her. But then she comes along and shows me extra love. That's godly love. That's powerful love. That's how we love one another. And it's not based on whether we feel it or not. It's based on, well, what's the thing I need to do that's best for them? And God says, you want to love me? I can't do what's best for God. So instead, the second commandment is like it. They go together. You want to show love for me? Let me see it in how you love your neighbor. That's how you express it. That's how we show it. We show God love in worship, when we sing, and when we pray. But the love God is really looking for is that second commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. And on that, every other command hinges or depends, is underneath. And that's my last sermon. I hope I get to preach it to you many, many more times. And we'll touch other topics, but I always want to keep coming back to this one. I always want to make sure that whatever else we cover... Let's make sure it's underneath and in subjection to the greatest commands. To love God, love each other, because in comparison, well, there is no comparison. Those are the commands that count the most. And if we pursue them, we'll do the other commands. And if we're doing the other commands out of love, then we're accomplishing the first two commands. And so it all goes together, and it should. But I keep wanting to focus my heart and my mind 
my soul, my strength. I want to keep turning it where it belongs. And I want us as a church to keep pushing where it belongs. So again, you're going to hear this sermon again. At least I sure hope so. I, get the, I hope I get the chance to preach it to you many times for a long time. Because I need to hear it. I think you do too. We all need to hear it. We all need to be reminded that Jesus said something was more important than anything else. Let's put that in our hearts. church. Colby has just given you what he considers his first and last sermon. He gives it to you on the hope that it won't be his last, but if it is, you will have heard the best that he's got. My question to you today is, will this communion service be your last one? Will you approach it as if it is your last one? If it's not, you'll be privileged to have others, but it's my thinking that you should approach every communion service as if it will be your last. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13, starting in verse 5, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. Let's have a prayer for the bread. Our Heavenly Father, as we prepare to partake of this bread which represents Christ's broken body as it hung on that cross for the remission of our sins, we pray that we will do so in a manner acceptable and pleasing to you. And as always, this is done in remembrance of your Son, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen. We'll have a prayer for the fruit of the vine. Our Heavenly Father, as we prepare to partake of this fruit of the vine, it represents Christ's blood as it was shed on the cross for our sins. We pray that we will do so in an acceptable and pleasing manner. And as always, it's done in remembrance of him. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. That concludes our communion service. Thank you. Good morning, church. I hope this day has been a good day for you. I hope that you were able to worship God. You've been edified by your worship. We're living in a crazy world. The CDC has now decided that the virus really doesn't live on surfaces that long, so we don't have to clean them as much. I've got states that are allowing people to go to 
liquor stores and marijuana stores, but won't allow us to worship God. I've got a medical community that says having an abortion, killing an unborn baby, is an essential service, but a cancer screening is not. A knee replacement is not, but you can kill an unborn baby. It's a crazy world. And what I struggle with is I don't find a voice that's worthy of me listening to it. The medical community, I've seen uh, just craziness and opinions change and data changes. The politicians, you can't listen to that. I don't find a voice. Oh, we've got the media because you can find a sane voice there. No, there's no sane voice that's worthy of me listening to it. But we are a blessed people because we have someone that is worthy of listening to. In Revelation chapter 4, chapter 5, it's a story of, the, of a, a sealed document, a scroll that is sealed up, and they look around and nobody is worthy of opening that document. And the writer John says, I wept and wept because nobody was worthy of opening it. And they said, wait, someone is. Someone's worthy. And we have that someone who is worthy as our Savior. Jesus Christ is worthy of us listening to him. He is the truth, the truth that doesn't change. Not some new data comes in and everything we know is topsy-turvy. God has revealed his truth to us, and we are a blessed people to have Jesus Christ as our Savior. I want you to do something. Go to your interweb, click in your search bar and say, is he worthy praise and harmony? Because we want to get the acapella version here. And you'll find a song that talks about how messed up our world is, but how awesome Jesus Christ is. And we need to remember that. Now, especially. God has, has blessed us beyond measure. Hang on to those blessings and have a great week. Have a great week. Remember whose you are and who you are.